Great, cool. Yeah. Any news from the world? Yes, just today. Hey, Josh. Just talking about media and what we've read over the weekend. Yeah, a new vaccine. Two. This one reckons it's 95% rather than the 90% uh, of the other, which is pretty good. I mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we try not to look on the dark side too quickly. <laughs> but yeah, obviously, if it mutates in the way that it did within the minks, then yeah, yeah, the difficulty is they'll have to redevelop it. But it's quite impressive how quickly they've done a vaccine, really, in under a year of the epidemic beginning. That's, uh, yeah, it's not how it was 100 years ago. Josh, you get your hand up. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go for it. What is the divide between number 10 and Parliament that they were talking about on the news? So, uh, uh, many of you may have read about Dominic Cummings and his goings this weekend. Yeah. Um, so the divide is that Dominic Cummings tried very hard to sort of break down the traditional civil service into working between Parliament and Number 10. And, and he tried to re-centralise power away from MPs and the sort of sovereignty of Parliament, if you will, and it's definitely how sort of MPs talk about it, right? And they've been talking about it in the whole COVID emergency stuff, saying, oh, decisions are being made without us. No one's talking to us. We're just getting told to vote and we're being whipped. And then we don't know anything. We're just signing off, which is funny, of course, because most of them vote even if they do know, you know, they vote with the whip anyway. <laughs> so it's strange. But the, the division comes from Boris Johnson looking like a total mess. Basically, because Dominic Cummings is now gone after he had re-centralised lots of different civil service power and lots of different deliberative time, so political time, away from the MPs, therefore Parliament, and to himself and his sort of cabal of like Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane. So two of those three have now left because Boris Johnson's the last man standing in um, what was, you know, a fairly explosive kind of team who upset pretty much everybody. Well, now Parliament feels that they can and should reassert their position as a primary player in the development of uh, policy direction and UK legislation. So that's where we're at. That was a big news story over the weekend. Huge, really. Uh, Dominic Cummings properly well, I was going to say drop the ball, but I actually think something else has happened. Any other theories on if he's gone, why he's gone? Is it significant? What does it mean for the future? What will it change, for example? It's an odd one, isn't it? Because you think, oh, oh sorry, was I, no, just thinking. Um, yeah, it's, it's an odd one because you'd think, oh, that's it. He's gone. Like, he's not affecting policy he's not doing anything right he's not getting paid but you also have to try and remember that he's already a millionaire and his like his father-in-law is a billionaire so he wasn't doing it for the money ever so what was he doing it for he was doing it for power and for control and to affect things so he'd only leave really because he, he's clearly the kind of guy who has been hated at work before and reveled in being hated, right? He's clearly the kind of guy who could live with a job even if he was hated by his boss, who he doesn't really respect. And you can tell he doesn't really respect possibly anyone. So what has happened, you could argue, was possibly on his terms. Here's one. He's got Brexit done, pretty much, right? Boris Johnson has to isolate for the next two weeks. So we can't be involved in the Brexit negotiations. So we can't really change the massive amount of direction of those negotiations to be all that different in the next two weeks, certainly. Okay, so that takes us right through to December, pretty much, let's double check. Yeah, that definitely takes us right through to December, right? Difficult part about December is 
everybody stops working on the 20th, pretty much in politics, everybody. So that's a whole 10 days where nothing happens and usually another five days after New Year. But it doesn't really matter because Brexit proper happens, i.e. the muck hits the fan on January 31st. So we know that Boris cannot do anything until December 1st. We also know that there are 10 days of December wherein nothing can be done. And Boris Johnson, being Boris Johnson, probably wouldn't do anything for those 10 days anyway. So there are 20 days in which the centralized power that Dominic Cummings has already made, has already kind of built up, now has a minor absence, right? Because policy can continue at any level of the civil service. It just needs to be kind of guided by ministers. But 20 days in negotiation times is nothing. Nothing without proper leadership and or a hand at the tiller pushing hard to get things done. So in some ways, Dominic Cummings has done everything he needed to do. He got it done because there's only 20 days to undo it. In which case, it ain't going to be undone. I read an old article about his, uh, his favourite gesture in the last few days of him working was to, somewhat childishly, but whatever, was to exit every room he was in and, and pull a pin from an imaginary hand grenade and throw it behind him as he walked out. So it just kind of shows you like he was happy just to, you know, walk out of every room and destroy everything. He's such a punch in the Oh yeah, no, he's clearly like a terrible person. He clearly doesn't actually care all that much because otherwise he would be there to, you know, if he really, really believed in all this stuff, he would be there to guide it and make sure it did its job and did it well. But I don't know if you saw, but the, um, the Kent lorry park they've built for Brexit was built on a floodplain and last week flooded. So the workings that they have worked out as much as they have, uh, yeah, they don't work. And that of course will cause tensions. There is very likely to be a serious amount of chaos in January. Um, as a teacher, it's not really my job to tell you uh, because you don't need to worry about it. But as a political teacher uh, or a politics teacher, um, it's an important thing to keep an eye on, especially over New Year, because come January, it will uh, change a lot of people's political views, it will get people discussing politics a lot more, and it may um, it may change your political views. Who knows? But yeah, that's the that's the big thing of where we're at, and it's a great question to get us there, Josh. All right, we've still got a few minutes for media if we want it. Any any more for any more? Why does Brexit mean we need a lorry park? So Brexit means we need a lorry park in Kent. Um, just I'll just get that flooded picture up for you. Uh, it means we need a lorry park in Kent because of the new customs systems. So in the um, in the period when we were in the EU, we had, um, if you remember from first term of AS, we did the, the sort of four pillars or the three pillars and then what eventually became the four freedoms of the EU. Freedom of goods, freedom of movement, freedom of finance, freedom of services, right? Uh, freedom of goods is food and anything else we want to sell in the EU is guaranteed by EU law to go over all the countries of the EU so long as it meets certain criteria. Well, as soon as we stop being in the EU, we stop being in that customs area. So there's no more freedom of goods. Stop being in the EU means no more freedom of movement of people. So we have different passports, we have different customs, we have different lines in the airport or ferries or whatever else. So there's no more freedom of movement stopping in the EU. It means we can't do services over borders and it means we can't exchange capital or money over borders. So all of that means that every single one of those four things now needs new layers of bureaucracy or stamping, form checking, triple checking, checking it meets the same criteria as the EU, all that kind of stuff. For example, when lorries drive through Switzerland, they, even though they have 
bilateral agreements with the EU, they still have to stop very briefly, jump out, stamp the paperwork, or get it stamped by the Swiss authorities, go through Switzerland, jump out at the border, get it stamped again, and go again. And that takes about 15 minutes in total. Sometimes they have to go to offices, sometimes they have to wait. If they haven't got the right paperwork, it can take five hours. That has been agreed over the course of 40 years, right? And that's why they've got it down. The UK gave itself one year to do something Switzerland has done in 40. And it hasn't done anything because it hasn't even got past the negotiation stages. It could have four years ago said we're going to take 10 years to do this. It didn't. It could have said, you know what, we'll retain membership of the European Economic Area. We'll go back to like Margaret Thatcher had it. But they didn't do that either. They said, no, nothing. These are our red lines. And Theresa May put the red lines down and. Um, well, uh, we are where we are. So uh, now the lorry park they built, they built on a floodplain. And that's what it looked like a few days ago. So the lorry park is there so that, like I said about Switzerland, when they get to Kent and therefore Dover and the biggest crossing point for so many of our goods, so many of our food exports and imports like lettuce, oranges, bananas, all of those things come through bigger European ports and obviously Spain grows uh, and Croatia, for example, can grow uh, satsumas all year round pretty much. It's crazy how warm it is there in the winter. So yeah, most of the sort of fresh food that we eat, if you look on the packaging, you'll be like, oh, Spain, tomatoes, oh, Portugal, grapes, Italy, wild. Because the UK cannot grow all of the things we've sort of gotten used to eating over the last 40 years. So what that means is they were planning on letting our lorries wait here, do all the paperwork, and then slowly go through the Dover ferries or the uh, Channel Tunnel and stuff like that. But yeah, they kind of screwed it up. And so after. Oh, right. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Austria's got a serious problem with the far right, which of course is, no, it is, it is important because it's a danger for the UK, but also, of course, famously, who came from Austria? And then went on. <laughs> yeah, Hitler came from Austria. So it, it, fascism in that way, I mean, we've talked about it before a bit. It doesn't go away strictly. It emerges in, in moments like that. There's nothing wrong with Islam. You don't see people outside that church there going, oh, are you making Wales too Catholic? You're making Wales too, too Christian. But you do see knobheads in Swansea outside mosques and sometimes outside um, Jewish uh, places of worship. Forgotten. Synagogues. synagogues. Thanks, thanks. Yeah. You sometimes see them outside of synagogues. You're controlling the world. You're all bankers. This kind of stuff. Because fascism, yeah, it exists. And in, in Austria, some argue that the Austrian government currently is way too far right to, uh, to be doing healthy stuff for their citizens. Josh. In the long run, could a religious political party work? They already do, bud. Yeah, they already do. In certain places, religious political parties are the biggest. For example, Angela Merkel's party is the Christian... Yeah, there you go. Thanks very much. Uh, is the... Yeah, Christian... Oh, what's the German name? Uh, it's the CDU and the CSU in Germany and Bavaria. Uh, it's like Christian Deutschland Unity, so Christian German Unity Party. So obviously they they you know they hold on to their Christian principles, but they're also about um, federalism, therefore the unity of Germany, and they work with the Bavarian Christian Party as well. So yeah, no, it's entirely possible, entirely possible. Don't forget that the Conservatives in the UK um, have 
conservative bishops in the House of Lords, because we still have members of the clergy in our second uh, second house, second chamber. And that means that, you know, they can be a political party if, or associate to, if they so wish. They're supposed to be independent, but most of them don't. They, they can properly take Tory money. And Jacob Rees-Mogg, uh, just last year, was on Good Morning Britain saying, uh, early last year, uh, saying he doesn't support abortion. He doesn't support uh, gay marriage in churches, doesn't support uh, loads of stuff. Like he says, I believe in the traditional Catholic teachings, which wouldn't give women the vote either. So, you know, let's not presume that Britain is free from all of this stuff. Devolution, however, which is today's topic, e segue into stuff we have to move on to, uh, tries to avoid all that. So, um, oh, actually, before I uh, before I forget, um, just one more thing, and this may be of interest. I'll share the second screen. Share content. Yeah, there is a Zoom on Wednesday night um, to find out about uh, Wales' housing crisis. What people are doing about it, what they're discussing, uh, and what it means. If you're interested, it, it's also about, you know, houses for young people, because at the moment we don't have enough. We do not have enough. We have a crazy number of people on council waiting lists. We have a crazy number of uh, people who elect to be homeless because the private rented sector is so expensive or crazy and the uh, council waiting lists are so long. So yeah, and you know, many of those homeless people are of all ages. Whenever you go to somewhere like Cardiff or Swansea, pre-pandemic, uh, it was it was sad. It was really sad. So yeah, something to consider. All right, all right. Show, show, show. Last week, hopefully you've still got your uh, stuff, your notes. If you haven't, I'll give you a brief reminder. We, 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 we looked at the powers of the First Minister and the Wales Act that got us there. Can anyone tell me what the most recent Wales Act is? Wales Act 2020. 2020, you know it. 2020 Wales Act is the most recent. And before 2018, so that was the Senate and elect. Oh, it's the Senate and Elections 2020 bill, isn't it? Senate and Elections 2020 bill that got us to where we're at now in regards to how devolution works and whatnot. But before, and this is something we didn't really kind of go into. We talked about how we have a reserved powers model, but before 2018, so pre 2018, and the uh, 2017 Wales Act, the one before 2020, basically, uh, pre 2018, Welsh devolution, Welsh devo, operated. And here's the kicker on a conferred C O M F E double -R, R E D powers model, wherein Westminster conferred their powers and what they could do. So pre 2018, let's just get this up. So it's only really in the last two years that the Welsh Government and the Welsh Parliament has had the freedom to 
to really affect absolutely everything that is not uh, reserved. And also, that then takes us up uh, to somewhere similar to Scotland, but we'll get to that, we'll get to that, because the list of reservations that we have even now is ridiculous. It is huge. The reservations is something like um, 154 reservations. It's mad. Westminster have just gone, well, yeah, Scotland might have lots of stuff, but you, Wales, well, no, you're not allowed to do these 154 things or whatever it is. We'll find out when the internet works. Yes, reserve powers model in Schedule A of uh, one of the seven air back. So maybe it's in all of them. Maybe we'll update it, sorry. General reservations. The Constitution cannot affect the British Constitution, but we can affect the Welsh. Public service. We cannot change the way. Oh, let's zoom in because you can't see this properly. Yeah cannot mess with political parties, cannot mess with the single legal jurisdiction of England and Wales. Now again, it's probably good to get down these general reservations, but we'll talk just chat about the specific ones. Josh, you got your hand up. I'm going to take a trip across the room to get my pan. Great, thanks, Matt. No worries. Don't worry. Yeah. Eve. Even today, or even in 2020, the reservations or reserved powers to Watson's. are huge and numerous. And on screen, we have the general reservations. Go for it, Josh. It turns out that I do not have my pen on me, so I'm going to have to go to a different room and borrow someone else's pen. That's grand. Thanks for checking. Go for it. Thanks, bud. So, if you've got those down, um, we'll let Josh get them down as well. What do we remember about the legal jurisdictions of Britain? Exactly so. So we've got three big ones, the Scottish one, the Northern Irish one, the England and Wales one. The general reservations, you can see the single legal jurisdiction of England and Wales cannot be touched by the Welsh Government or Welsh Parliament. Even though just recently there was a commission uh, started by Carolyn Jones in 2018, I think, and it finished late 2019. Uh, no, wait, was it 2018? It was either late 2017 or early 2018 when Carolyn started it. And um, yeah, it reported late last year, saying that there should be a legal jurisdiction for Wales. There should be four legal jurisdictions in the UK. So the commission made by the Welsh Government has a report to go to all governments of the UK. Even though Welsh Government commissioned it, cannot be put into action by the Welsh Government. However, 
if the Scottish government were to do something different with their legal jurisdiction, they're totally allowed to do it. The same is true of certain transport matters. The Scottish government has full control over rail transport and road transport. Full. No reservations. Nothing. The Scottish can do what the hell they want. Wales, as you can see, has certain road transport, rail transport, quite a lot of transport reservations, really. So if you're going to think about Scotland as having like Premier League devolution and Wales has got, well, Cymru League devolution, what does this tell you? Really unbalanced. Devolution is really unbalanced. One of the main points you can take from today is that devolution is unbalanced and the way that it is described politically in another sentence is that devolution is asymmetric. Asymmetric. Is I can't remember if asymmetric is spelled A double S or a single S, but I'll just check. It's just one. Yeah. And that's how it's described in political constitutional structures around the world. Devolution in the UK, UK devolution is a symmetric. <laughs> and that will come up time and time again. Uh, whether it's in essays or uh, university theses around the future of devolution. And one of the reasons the Welsh Government has continuously pushed for more and more Wales Acts is just simply to be at the same level as Scotland. They're not yet there, though they are on the same powers model now that Scotland is, on the reserved powers model. Would you say Possibly, yeah, could be that. Uh, it could also be, I mean, I'm not one to sort of ascribe too much to the sort of medieval history of Wales, because I think that by the 1800s, whether Westminster cared or not, most of Wales was Welsh speaking um, still. Uh, it had a massive industrial thing, you know. Wales, Swansea was the copper capital of the world in the 1800s. It was one of the biggest Copper, iron, coal. Wales in the 1800s was one of the richest countries in the entire world. And they were loud and proud about everything it being Welsh. And obviously in time it grew to be part of the British Empire uh, as the empire expanded and, you know, stamped its name on everything. And that's fine too, you know, this is all part of history, Wales. Some people argue pushed against it, some argued fully embraced it and loved getting rich. You know, you look at uh, Pennsylvania. It's full of Welsh place names like Bala and Cunwys and uh, yeah, more. The place where Joe Biden comes from nearby, a bunch of Welsh place names. So um, it could be that, or it could be that the first vote for Welsh devolution in 1997 was won by 0.5%. And so they went really slowly. Do you remember that term? They gained losers' consent. So the losers' consent thing is getting like people like the Tories on side, the abolished people who used to be abolished and now are just Tories or whatever, or Lib Dems or who knows. And so it, you know, they didn't want to rock too many boats all at once. It was only after the 2011 referendum that people went, oh, okay, most people want this. Let's go and let's go faster. Which is why, in the last 10 years alone, the powers of the Welsh government have trebled. They are literally in the same sort of number of people they had 10 years ago, but the powers they've got are huge, which is why we saw that video last week about talking about expanding the number of MSs. Did you yeah, so their vote in 1997 was much better. I say better, it was bigger. You know, they, they had a clear, clear majority. And that meant that the UK went, well, okay, 
you can have as much as you need. And Blair being, you know, at that time quite generous with the sort of manifesto promises and the devolution settlements, he said, yeah, give them as much as we can. And the Scottish, uh, you know, debated it and um, pretty much off the bat, apart from, I think it was one Scotland Act, maybe two, where we've had, you know, four or five, uh, one or two later, they were in the reserve powers model, full Scottish control over the size of their own parliament as well, which we didn't have until this year. And that's a big deal. So they could expand or contract as they saw fit, which we can only just do this year. So yeah, the most important part to take away from all of this stuff is that UK devolution is asymmetric. For example, in Northern Irish Assembly, they have to share power between unionists and nationalists, which is a crazy, crazy kind of way to work, but they have to, to keep the peace. Literally the peace treaty of the Good Friday Agreement. Okay, now that you know how uh, interesting the structures of devolution are across the UK, probably time to take a look at the fairly simple legislative process of the Senate. In fact, it's much simpler than Westminster. So you know how in Westminster they have first reading, second reading, reports, third reading, right? Well, let's uh, make some room on this here board. In the Senate, there are just five stages. And they're all oh, transparent. In the Senate, well, through the Senate, oh, has just five stages. Damn it. Ah, that's too big. <laughs> Come on. Yes, please. Five stages of a bill through the Senate. And we'll kind of check in on the various stages with the official bits so you can see how it works in that way. You know what? I will put it there so you can see them all. Let's space them out so it's easier for you to read. So stage one is a little like the first reading that we talked about in Westminster. However, there is a plenary, a plenary vote. And don't worry about the term plenary just yet. If you don't know what it is, we will get onto it with examples because it happens in every single week, if not twice a week in Welsh government and the Senate practice. Again, not necessarily so in Westminster if they don't want it to be. So yes, yeah, stage one is a bit like the first reading, stage three is a bit like the second reading, and stage four is the third reading. However, again, 
unlike Westminster, in the Senate, every time it can be voted down completely and destroyed. If there is monumental, unanimous disagreement from the Senate versus the executive or Welsh government, then Welsh government can and often in the past have been something. So unlike Westminster, it can still be stopped at the final stage. Indeed, it can even be stopped after the final stage if the Council General deems it uh, not legally applicable or damaging to the intergovernmental machinery. In fact, the Secretary of State for Wales also has a say in stage four. But we'll get to that. These are just the big headlines for now. Excuse me. Cool, cool. Really good, 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 good. All right, I'm going to leave that up there so we can kind of talk through it a bit. Um, has anyone watched Cleanery in the Senate? Every Tuesday afternoon. Not that your Tuesday afternoons are free. <laughs> it's my day off, so sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. However, it is available on senev.tv. So, TV. this also, if you get really interested in this stuff, or if you need any evidence, for example, has a back catalogue, a massive, massive archive of all of the committee meetings that are made transparent and legally available, uh, and all of plenary. So there could be stuff interested in the future, like if you get interested in law or legislation, justice and constitution, we talk about literally the future, external affairs, so intergovernmental relations between Europe and Wales and all the various others. Welsh Youth Parliament met on the 14th, which I didn't know about, which is very, very nice. Actually, was the, well, it's the Welsh Parliament, like, yeah, but it's a bit more updated. It doesn't have the, uh, you know, the 600 year old traditions around dragging the speaker to the chair and that stuff. What it does have, interesting, is what, um, oh, maybe that's not going to load for whatever reason. Um, it's all on tradition, it's quite sort of the black wall. In so Westminster. Yeah. Be, but... yeah, there are loads of those. Yeah. There's about six of the different positions. Um, yeah, Black Rod has to bang on the door. It slams the door in. Oh, it slams the door in this woman's face. And then he has to hit it three times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's to do with like various historical occasions when Westminster's almost been like blown up or, you know, attacked or whatever else. So then they sort of use it as a historical example. The same as the Speaker being dragged to the chair, which they still do in the Canadian Parliament as well. Yeah, they definitely do in Canada. I'm unsure about Australia. Um, it's because it's traditionally uh, not a great role in that you no longer have a political voice proper. You can't vote on stuff. You have to um, be as objective as you can, even though you're from a political party. You still have to try and be as balanced and as fair. So in the past, no one wanted to do it because you can't affect policy. You can't. Uh, be a leader of a party, you can't, you know, work your political magic, you've just got to do the job. However, 
it's exceptionally well paid. So people nowadays in Westminster love going for it. Oh, good question. Yeah, they replaced it. Yeah, they replaced it after John Burko, didn't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sir Lindsay Hoyle. <laughs> yeah, he's he's already had a bit of a bit of rage, from what I understand as well, because of the hybrid proceedings in the House of Commons. Yeah, yeah. But it's funny, of course, he's uh, he's only been in the job for a year. So um, let's take a quick look at plenary. So you've got questions to the first minister. This is when the the big stuff happens. Oh wait, that's that's tomorrow, isn't it? Yeah, okay, that's tomorrow. <laughs> All right, let's look at the archive. Wait, no, that's not. That's the. So again, there are two plenaries a week. Go back. Go back. Go back. And one of them has first minister's questions, which are fruity, often. They're a bit spicy. So instead of having a speaker, we have a sewage, just a bit like the chair. Really? Yes, indeed. However, unlike Westminster, it isn't brought in and out every time. It's left there at the beginning of a government, the whole term, the whole four or five years. No, no, it's that is the only element of monarchic tradition. It's the, the, that little. It is well. It's not little, really. I mean, right next to it, it's sort of, sort of, you know, a good meter long, and it is cast. It's metal proper, it's relatively heavy, but you lift it. It's like seven k, maybe it's nothing. Like that. A few of these, if that. Um, and yeah, it's the only, only sort of bit of leftover monarchy because it's the official symbol of the monarchy. That this is a parliament. It can operate in Britain. It has legal weight. But that's Ellen uh, Jones, I think, from Plaid Cymru, and she is a villain. Exactly so. Yes, um, they designed it in order for it to be more collaborative and in compromise. Yeah. Scotland is, Northern Ireland is still quite oppositional because it's in an old building, not a brand new building. The Senev has been built in your lifetimes. The Senev you know now wasn't there 20 years ago. It wasn't there when I was a kid. And the first building they were in wasn't the Senev building in Cardiff Bay. But yes, when they designed this parliament, they specifically designed it so it would be more collaborative, uh, mostly because they presumed and um, actually, that's proven to be truthful. Yeah, that's interesting. They presume that the PR or mixed system we have now of electing members of the Senate, you know, we have first past the post on constituency, but we have proportional representation on um, party based voting on the regional lists. Well, proportional representation almost always leads to compromise and coalition. So you need a circle for that. You can't be shouting at the people that you're being party or in government with in a week's time or whatever, the whole time. So yeah, that's uh, so it. And um, she is the sort of speaker of, I want to see what the direct translation, oh, the dictionary won't work because I've got the bloody, oh, engineer direct translation of so it. Oh yeah, go, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There's like speaker, but. Um, 
It is just presiding officer. So it. Hmm. Interesting. It kind of just sounds older in my head. Like, but anyway, yeah. Yeah, we don't have to fully wait for Owen to get back to watch some plenary. Um, First Minister's questions can appear odd in that often the first question he gets from someone, he'll have an easy instant answer for. But it's the follow up questions which are the spicy bit. Should add, of course, this is from literally this year, where everything in Parliament has become half and half, where some of the members are in Parliament, some of them are online. Before you took this course, what did you know about the Welsh Government? Yeah, yeah. No, that's more than a lot of people. I tell you. It's interesting, isn't it? Because it it does have a lot of power over our day-to-day -day lives, like hospitals, roads. Uh, not taxes, not until this year. Um, and even then, only 5% of taxes. But housing regulation, like you want to build a new house, that regulation comes from Welsh Government. They control what you can and cannot build. Uh, fishing, farming, Welsh Government. Uh, hospitals, prescriptions, environment, Welsh Government. Uh, schools, Welsh Government. Just looking at greenery, not my uh, girlfriend's face or something. <laughs> Just looking at the hybrid greenery where some people are in Los Enes and others are at home on Zoom and whatnot. Pretty interesting as well, seeing politicians' Zoom corners, I think. But yeah, uh, is it? I suppose it is a bit, yeah. <laughs> wow, wow. Oh, a spitting image. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. I mean, uh, yeah, as so long as they are punching up, you know, taking the mick out of type people in power, then that's good. It's good to know. I haven't had time. Um, because she's actually in Plaid Cymru. She is a Welsh speaker. Uh, I think she's from somewhere uh, just west of 
Gwent way, um, Newport and Gwent way. Uh, and I, I don't know, maybe she's in her parents' house or something, or maybe she just loves those sorts of old pictures and whatnot that have been given. It's quite, quite adorable. But this is the way that Parliament is run at the moment. Um, and she's talking about the media deficit, whereby not everyone in Wales knows what the Welsh Government does. Hopefully this year, thanks to the crisis, is really up to people's understanding. But uh, she's got a little bit more to say, so let's find out. So he's, he's committed there, he's made a compromise. It's interesting. Josh, your hands up, go for it. I can't hear it. Oh, damn it. Sorry, bud. Damn it, damn it, damn it. Ah, I don't know where. I'm gonna, I'm gonna just try another archive one. So stick with us. I wanna try one from last year so you can see what it's like when all the politicians are actually in. Because it might seem a bit uh, stuffy, Today or last week, because obviously they're on Zoom and they're all trying to be as polite as Zoom allows. But there have been some raucous moments. There have been some brouhaha. There have been some serious like boos. Actually, I was because in the Senate, when you go, you can actually sit right above where all those chairs are. Right above, so you're looking down into the bowl, as it were, the actual chamber, and. Uh, and yeah, it's 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 kind of wild. Um, let's see, let's see. How do I search the old archive? What election was next to For the Welsh government, Welsh Parliament. So, uh, yeah. Unless we can take part. Unless we can. We can oh yeah, 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 yeah. Sixteen-year-olds and above can take part in May next year. Yeah. Yeah, so there will likely be local government votes at the same time. So if you're interested in that, um, that's a thing. Is that early, like early next year? Or year May. Or May. The campaign will begin in, oh, maybe I didn't have time to tell you. Damn it. And maybe I did. In April, I won't be able to teach you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I did tell you. Yeah. Yeah. April, um, I mean, again, we will have everything on the two units done by April. Uh, but yeah, I'll be I'll be on the road. Not yet. Again, uh, chatting with the head uh, when he's got free time this week. We were hoping to squeeze it in today, but um, extra meetings came up. You would not believe how many meetings our poor head teacher is in every single day. It's mad. Poor poor fella. I do not envy him. Yeah. 
September, yeah. So you'll have basically some continuous assessment stuff in June, July, uh, and then break. But again, in the um, June, July period, we'll also be going over essay and exam stuff. Uh, and then come your A level, I'll be with um, just the six formers full time. So um, I'll also be available for like extra mental help if you want. Uh, just literally a one on one session with essay stuffs. Got loads of that stuff ready for you at the end of the year. And you know, this year you're quite lucky in a way because you know, there's not having the proper external exams going on the continuous assessment. And I know you're all putting in a fucking wicked amount of effort. So, you know, it's uh, it's it's great to here we go. Here we go. yeah, it's great to be able to do that. So it just means that like you don't get that stress. Nice. Okay. We've got a plenary from last year. Josh, uh, put your hand up. I'm going to watch if you can or cannot hear it in the different ways that it's done. Ah, oh, damn it. Picked the wrong one. Sorry. Let me go back. Because what's really, uh, what's really, what's really interesting to watch is the ways in which First Minister can be uh, prompted, really. You know the way Boris Johnson has Prime Minister's questions? And basically, he laughs his way through it, doesn't he? He stands up and he goes, blah, 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 blah. I think I'm fine. Blah, 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 blah. And then sits back down and doesn't really do anything or compromise. But we've just seen that the First Minister's literally just compromised with the Plaid Cymru speaker about making things clearer for everyone next year. And probably that means funding more papers and who knows what to get the message out there about Welsh elections as well as increase the wider media sphere. Well, last year you still get, because we were there meeting in person, you know, you still get massive disagreements. You get people booing each other, laughing at various people. Some of the questions, oh, there was one, while that's coming up briefly because the internet is looking through today, there was one where, um, Again, tell me if you can hear this, Josh. There was one where um, a particular group of campaigners got mentioned by the Conservatives in the Parliament. Oh, okay, where have you gone? Where have you gone? Okay. Here, see this. this. Can you hear that, Josh? I have no idea where you can't hear that. What you know what I'm going to do, I'm going to unshare and then reshare. Because Teams is a bit of a nightmare sometimes, man. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so a week today, um, it will be here. Let's try this again. Sorry, Josh. Uh, sorry, it's been a while since I watched that, and he's literally talking about me, which is just <laughs> funny to me. Um, and sorry, you couldn't hear that, Josh. Uh, I'm going to have to 
find out from the team at the hub teams why. So hopefully the centered thing has popped up. Um, let's see if this is a bit different. Sometimes it's literally just the difference between sharing the screen and sharing. So all the laptops is a, is a good question because some people hate them, some people love them. They're supposed to be that you can reduce paper usage. You should be able to come in, log in, and everything that you had, say, in your office, because the Senev uh, is one building, and then they have T. Howell, which is the sort of administrative building, right? Um, and that's where most of the offices are. That's where the work happens. Different floors house, like, um, uh, you know, MS is for, I think on one level it's like Labour and Plaid Cymru, and then on another one, uh, another one it's like Tories and and UKIP and whoever. But obviously that changes depending on who gets elected to the parliament and the size of those parties. But then on the top levels you've got like um, first minister, office of the first minister, level down cabinet, cabinet officers and ministers, cabinet civil service, that kind of thing. So then you should be able to go from those you know highly classified offices we have crazy amounts of detail crazy amounts of uh, protected data and even you know intergovernmental stuff defense security terrorist threat levels you should as the, even the first minister be able to go in sit down log in and all the stuff you were doing prior be right in front of you should you need it yeah yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, and it's a big problem um, because it's deeply inefficient. Uh, it's bad for the environment, but worse than that, on a security level, it's also why Westminster has so many leaks. Like if you've got a driver and you leave a tiny bit of that paper or document that's super high classified, highly classified, well, the driver's not going to read it, not going to not read it, sorry. <laughs> you know, you're a driver and you're paid to just sit there and like not pay attention piece of paper in your back, you might go, oh, and subconsciously you'll naturally read something. Like anytime I pick something up with text on it, I don't not read it. I'm like, oh, and then I've read it. So yeah, the Welsh government tries very hard to be secure, tries to be uh, as environmentally friendly as possible. Also, Westminster prints off more paper than any other parliament in the world. They still, Westminster still has all of their laws written on vellum. You know what vellum is? It's like goat skin stretched every time they make a new bill they put on goat skin as well <laughs> they, just, they just do because it's the tradition we don't do that a bit of paper big uh, royal ascent seal when the royal says yes we smash it get some wax on that paper the show the rest of it goes on the computer right so let's just if we can if uh, josh can hear it um, just put your hand up if you cannot, bud, and I'll take a note and contact the teams again. We're just going to have a few minutes of the rowdiest that. Hand up, Josh. Cannot hear it. Can't hear it. Uh, sorry, bud. Um, I'm just going to have a few minutes then and um, uh, stick with us. I'll see if I can get some subtitles on.
basically, it's just important that you can see how full the parliament is and how rowdy it might become. So here, obviously, you have a front bench, as you would in any other parliament, the sort of government bench. And here you have back benches, uh, both of this party, of the ruling party, Labour and Conservatives. You have your shadow uh, leaders there and your shadow leaders usually here. And you've got the speaker or presiding officers here. And uh, yeah, it can get quite rowdy. It is uh, noticeable that Adam Price and Mark Drakeford have locked horns many a time in that parliament now. So let's stop. Oh, what's that button? Include. Ah, oh, mailed. You'll be able to hear it now, Josh. I'm sorry. Damn it. I didn't realize that was like an extra thing I had to do. That's ridiculous. For example, can you hear this? I call members to order, and before we move to today's business, I want to mark the sad news. And Did you hear that, Josh? Yes. Ah, okay. Okay. I'll be sure to remember that from now on. But yeah, um, has anyone been to the Senate? Yeah. 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 Ooh, nice. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, um, you know now what it looks like on the inside as well as the out. There are um, debates and have been debates since the beginning of devolution uh, about the. Oh, where's it gone? But uh, whether or not this legislative process is thorough enough. Now, you know, last week we talked about and we saw a video about are there enough members? Uh, to thoroughly scrutinise and make sure the legal process and the legislation process is right and is fair and is done uh, thoroughly enough. Well, um, again, what's important to note is, we'll just go through the official sites. What's important to note is obviously you've just seen the ways in which parties try to get the government to work with them, through someone like Play Cumberland's Get a Jewel just recently, through to the Conservatives telling them the business. The process in detail can be looked at right here. I will put this link on Teams later. But this is stage one. This is the uh, introduction. And then if it goes by committee, so this is, if you want to take any separate notes from this, you can say the addition to stage one is that the committees get to review it as well as the Senate. Stage two, well, the members of the Senate begin tabling amendments, so proposing changes to the bill as soon as it starts as soon as it's gone through that first stage one and uh, been in plenary uh, or at least in the and um, voted on it gets another two committees another two committees at stage two which is crazy really doesn't necessarily happen in westminster the party or opposition can just table something and it can come into parliament on an opposition day motion or parliament can just be introduced by government. So again, you've got you've got a review or at least a committee looking at it at stage one. You've got another two committees looking at it at stage two. Stage three is literally the amendment and committee stage. So you've got however many with a report stages of committees within stage three. So when we said oh, how's it gone? When we said amendments and reports, we really did mean like it's not just, you know, oh, here's a two page essay I've written about why it's good. All of these things happen with experts coming to committees, finance checks, thorough checks, committees reviewing all the amendments, seeing if they're legally appropriate as well as constitutionally. So, again, exports, 
building reports, which can be done in anywhere between six months, if not more, if it's an exceptionally difficult piece of legislation that might change everything. And all of that stuff is all before there's a proper Senate vote. So you've really got, you know, two stages within stage one, two or three stages within stage two, three or four stages within stage three, and then you've got the vote. And then even after stage four, this is the difficult part, because, the, and here's an additional note you might want to take, the Secretary of State can make an objection if they feel it would be damaging to Westminster. And this is the, again, additional checks. So the debates on the sort of legislative effectiveness Well, you know, there are a lot of checks there. I don't know. I can understand the debates around whether or not it's scrutinized enough, whether or not it makes sense. In that way, like, are there enough people to, you know, there's 60 people trying to look after 3.3 million people's rights and laws. That's a lot of weight on 60 shoulders. That's an understandable position. But legislative stages, I mean, like I say, there are two or three in each one of those. So you've really got 10 stages. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Anything? You think we should have another chamber, like America has the House and the Senate, and things go back and forth, ping pong. Uh, you, London has the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Josh? No, they're stretching. That's enough. Sorry. <laughs> I often do that. I'm like, oh, hi. No, it's someone stretching. That's fine. Yeah, it's a tough debate. If anyone's got it, are you making me your That's shocking. Yeah. Um, but this comes down to like whether or not we think unicameralism, oh, God, I hate saying that word at the end of the day, unicameral structures uh, are better or bicameral or tricameral so for scrutiny scrutiny uh, well legislation and scrutiny this is the debate which is better the camera Camera or tri camera. For example, the Welsh Youth Parliament doesn't get to review those laws. It gets to make its own debates, but it doesn't get to make any laws. So obviously, unicameral is one body, bodies in, oh, Jeff, in bicameral, and three in tricameral. Yeah, yeah. In America's legislation with the, uh, or legislature, which is, uh, yeah, is officially titled Congress as a whole. We have the Senate and the House of Representatives. However, obviously, we know because they struggled under Obama and they struggled under Trump and they will likely struggle again under Biden, the Senate and the House very rarely agree because the Senate now, they, well, for the, the last 20 to 30 years, really, the, uh, yeah, the, Senate has been controlled by the Republicans and the House of Representatives has been controlled by the Democrats. So if that ever happens, well, you kind of shit out of luck for trying to get law made. So, 
do not see that. Wow. America's full of crazy senators, though. Yeah. I'm not surprised. Uh, that's shocking and bad. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but each to their own. Um, I have seen various uh, reps that are really interesting. I mean, I still think uh, Alexandria ocasio Cortez. Um, is you know is is one of the youngest American politicians they've ever had, and therefore kind of understands younger issues better. So, if for example, right, um, and here's a suggestion that I'm kind of working on creating a paper around at the minute. If for example you've got a bicameral situation like the UK, where the average age in the House of Commons is 57. And you've got the average age of some of the people in the House of Lords as 70. Should your voices as 16, 17, 18, uh, and should the voices of people below 35, keeping in mind that in America you cannot be president before the age of 35, should there be a third house for young people? So why not? What would it do if there was for scrutiny and legislation? Would it? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, these are all really important points. Like all of those problems and all of those good points would actually would be the case. And this is why constitutional politics, boring as it might be on a Monday afternoon sometimes, can be kind of sexy because you're basically throwing a brand new firework onto the bonfire. Kind of trying to mix things up. You're kind of going, right, how can we change this? How can we make it better, faster through legislation? But also, how can we ensure that more people are represented, that younger voices are heard, or that we don't get stuck in the two-party, two-body legislature? Oh, uh, quotas are really good. Quotas are really important. Political parties, however, don't always stick to quotas. So that's one of the problems. Then you would have to change the way that the electoral system works the way political parties are elected, right? So you wouldn't be able to use first past the post anymore. You'd only be able to use proportional representation, which would change Britain entirely, uh, which is parts of America, but not every part of America's voting system. And then you're onto the question of which is the better legislative legislature, proportional representation, where compromise is almost always sought, or first past the post, where you have your uh, as we put it previously, elected or elective dictatorship. My sort of thing in Germany was the two candidates in America each year are both older than the left. It's like 799 like winner with presidential party. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not surprised. We have, uh, for some reason, for ages now in politics, elected old white men. It's odd. Uh, I mean, Boris Johnson's almost 60. Like, he's not a spring chicken, even if he is having kids every two weeks with whoever. Like, you know, he's still, he's still an old boy. He's, you know, practically double my age or whatever. So, uh, maybe not, but still, it's mad. He's like four times like my age. Yeah, he'll be, he would certainly be four times older than all of you, I'd imagine. It's, it's odd to think that he would know anything about your lives, and yet, well, I mean, technically, have some control over the military. Technically, have. You know anything about? No. Yeah, that's right. That's like the MP, the MP. Craig Williams. Craig Williams. He, um, no, he probably knows about what people goes on things like around one percent of the population. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know, isn't it? Because they should do the reading, right? They should read the reports which show that. 
40% of Welsh people live in work and in work poverty. 40%, that's a lot, like, that's a huge problem. And yet they bluster about like everything's fine and they cough caviar paid for by the taxpayer and uh, champagne and all that in London and uh, vote not to feed hungry kids in England. Like there's a, there's a big problem in Westminster with disjunct and legislation and scrutiny also doesn't really bring into the question of where does accountability come from? This is what we'll be getting on to uh, next term, uh, no, next time, sorry. Accountability can and should sometimes come from people and protest, but really it should also come from justice systems. Legal challenge. Opposition. Opposition parties, people in protest. Oh, damn it. So that's important to get down. Where does accountability come from? And how does Wales not having its own legal and justice system affect accountability? In many ways, some argue that Welsh Labour, the party of power in Wales for the last 20 years over devolved, kind of likes not having the responsibility of our own legal and justice system because it gives them a get out clause. They can say, oh yeah, we'd love to change it. Oh yeah, no, we'd love to help with that. Oh, but we can't, we don't control the police. Sorry, just, just can't do it. Sorry, not my problem, not my fault. Sorry. And uh, some people would argue that that's not good enough. And so what we're kind of getting to in this final point is that sometimes, sometimes the asymmetry of devolution causes serious problems in scrutiny and accountability. Because if it's not a level playing field, how exactly can you make it better? So, any big questions? That's literally all we're doing today. Next time we're going on to like uh, impact of the history of devolution. Uh, we've we've covered a lot in this one lesson. All good. All good. All right. Thank you for your Monday afternoon focus. Josh, you've got a question. Go for it, bud. How are you? Say again, sorry. How old are you? Oh, <laughs> I'm 35. Although I'm sure most teachers would uh, demean me. But yeah, keep up the good work. Um, oh, I, I, yes, the homework. There is some homework. Uh, it's ongoing throughout the week, but I also put it on the uh, Q&A teams already. Get your questions ready for Helen Mary on Teams uh, next Monday. So um, we will be in here. If you've got a Teams device, please do bring it. I will be here with you. So if you haven't got a Teams device or whatever, or you don't feel comfortable, we can use a shared laptop here as well. But Josh, you'll need to call in there to the uh, visiting Q&A Teams that makes sense <laughs> and that's a week today great that's the homework prepare some questions for helen mary jones of plaid cymru fantastic all right thanks very much we'll see you next time on friday very welcome all cheers, cheers. 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 cheers.